In Luke chapter 19, Jesus said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. What a remarkable thing to say. Salvation, rescue, forgiveness, breakthrough, miracles, wholeness, healing. Today, salvation has come to this house. I believe that's true of tonight. I don't know your circumstances or what you've brought to this meeting, what challenges you have. But if you've brought your faith, today's salvation has come to this house. Right now, there are thousands of people watching online in your living rooms. This is not the time to go and get a cup of coffee. You better, you'd better pin your eyes to the screen because today, salvation has come to your house. There's healing in this meeting tonight. <laughs> miracles in this meeting tonight. I'm going for breakthrough, I'm going for miracles, I'm going for healings, I'm going for salvation in all its fullness tonight. And I want you to raise your expectation, raise your faith, raise your voice, raise your hands. Let's believe God together. Let's expect God to turn up in this place in the Name of Jesus. I'm, I've been doing this long enough not to have just another meeting. I don't want another meeting. I want God to turn up in my life. I wanna have an encounter with Him. I wanna be changed by Him. And I can't think of any good reason why this can't be the night when God turns up. So raise your hands, let's pray. Father God, thank You for every story every narrative, every challenge, every problem, every dream that is represented in this room and online tonight. I pray, Father, that You will break in to our situation. You will send Your Son into our heart and Your Holy Spirit to fill our lives. May we walk away from this place, Father, changed, turned around, different, not just having attended a meeting, but having met with a living God. In the Name of Jesus and everybody with faith shouted, Amen. Amen, Amen. Thank you team. You can all sit down. I'm excited about tonight. I've been thinking about this a long time and I have seen in my spirit Lives changed. In the middle of the 1990s, I was having trouble with my voice. I'd lost my voice. I couldn't speak properly. For a teacher, for a preacher, that's a big deal. But I heard about an evangelist who was coming to town, an evangelist who had seen many miracles in his life and ministry. He was visiting another church. So I purposefully went to the church, sat in the middle of the auditorium. To be honest, I have no idea of this man's name because ultimately it's not about the evangelist. It's about Jesus. It's about what He is here to give us. But in this song or in the service, we sang one of Delirious' songs, History Maker. Except I couldn't sing it because I didn't have a voice. So I was sort of mouthing the words and we came to the line, speaker of truth, to all mankind. That is my calling. That is my destiny. And here I was unable to be a speaker of truth. And I got desperate in that meeting. 
And I extended my faith. I leant forward in my spirit and I believed that that night God was going to turn up. Well, the evangelist got up to preach. I've no idea what he preached on. But suddenly he stopped and he literally leapt off the platform and he started walking across the seats. Everybody's looking at him because there were new seats. <laughs> the business manager, no doubt shaking his head. He couldn't care less. He just marched across the seats. I can't do it tonight, otherwise I was gonna do it because we've been COVID friendly. I'd break my neck in between each row. And he went straight toward me. And when he got to me in the middle of that message, he slammed his hand on my head and I was instantly healed. Here's the thing. What happened? I believe I acknowledged my need. I got passionate. I was desperate. I leant in. I released my faith. And faith is attractive. Hunger is like a magnet. God is attracted by faith. He's looking for an opportunity in this meeting to find someone who He can touch, He can change. It's not about the preacher, it's about Jesus. But in Acts chapter 14, in a place called Lystra, there was a man who had the same attitude to me as in that meeting. He came to the meeting believing for a miracle. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 14 in Lystra, verse eight, there sat a man who was lame. He'd been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. You can't see faith, but with the eyes of faith, you can see faith. And every time I stand up here on a platform, I'm looking out into the auditorium for faith. And I couldn't tell you how many people have come up to me in the last 45 years and said, do you remember the meeting when you got off the platform and you walked down to my seat and laid hands on me or you called me up onto the platform or you picked me out and prayed for me or you picked me out and prophesied over me. That night, I had an encounter with God. That night, everything changed. As I say, it's not about me doing it. It's about Jesus reaching out to you, walking across the seats to get to you. He's doing everything in His power, not just in this room, but online. He wants to get to you. I believe the same thing happened in the life of Zacchaeus. I'm gonna read you a passage about Zacchaeus. He's, he's someone we know about from Sunday school, but I don't believe we have learned what we need to learn from this passage. If Zacchaeus were in this meeting tonight, what would his advice be? Luke chapter 19 and verse one, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Notice he was hungry, he was expectant, he knew his need, he positioned himself. Can I just say, it matters where you sit in church. Just this week, as I was teaching my students, I noticed which students slowly moved forward to the front row. 
One of the students, I gave them a gift this week on the front row and she said, I've been praying specifically for that to happen. She positioned herself to ex receive a gift. Can I suggest to you that it matters where you sit? It matters how you position yourself. Now, if you've just come in late, don't panic. If you're on your own in your room, don't panic. Jesus can get to you there. But perhaps next week, move a seat forward. When Jesus reached the spot, He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So He came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to the house of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here and now, I give half my possessions to the poor and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham or in other words, a son of faith. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus offers Zacchaeus four things and, Jesus, and Zacchaeus responds appropriately. I'm gonna go through these four things so that you can see what God is offering tonight and how you should respond. And then I'm gonna put Zacchaeus on the platform and ask him what he would tell you tonight, how salvation can come to your house. So here are the four things. Firstly, Jesus offers us relationship, but we must respond to His Word. Timothy Keller writes in his book on prayer that all prayer is a response to God's initial conversation. God speaks and we respond. God has been speaking from the beginning of time. He has spoken through His Son, Jesus. He has spoken through His Word. What is your response? When Jesus spoke to Zacchaeus, He didn't stay in the tree. He didn't stay where He was. He believed that here was someone who could bring him life. When I was first told about Jesus in 1973, a man by the name of Joe Galusha quoted a scripture to me, John 10, 10. I have come that you may have life and have it in all its fullness. I've forgotten Joe, I've forgotten the conversation, I've forgotten all our arguments, but I could not forget that word. It gripped me in my spirit, it grabbed my attention. Here was someone offering me be life better than I could find it anywhere else. But it took me a year before I believed it for me. Some of you online or here, you know what God has said to you that He's offering you relationship and yet you've never believed Him enough to see your life changed. But here's Zacchaeus. Number two, Jesus offers us salvation, but we must acknowledge our lostness. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Billy Graham said, it's quite easy to get people saved. It's less easy to get people lost. People think they're okay. But Jesus told Zacchaeus, you're not okay. You're dead, you're lost, you're a sinner. Until we acknowledge our lostness, God cannot give us what He wants to give us. We think the world is made up of nice people and nasty people and we're the nice people. I've got news for you, you're all the nasty people. Jesus said this, 
outside of Christ, you are dead. There is no one who is righteous. No, not one. You're all sinners. And it wasn't until I threw myself on my bed in my university room and screamed out to heaven, there's got to be more to life than this. It wasn't until that happened, till God arrested me. We've got to get desperate. Zacchaeus teaches me that. Number three, Jesus offers us life, but we must allow Him to come into our homes. He said, I must stay at your house today. It's one thing meeting someone. We've heard the news that this week, Prince Philip has died. And people around the world have been talking about whether they knew him, whether they met him. I said yesterday to Amanda, yes, I met him or at least saw him. And my mother-in-law wrote and said she had a conversation with him in India in 1963. But there's one thing, seeing someone at a distance or having a conversation with him, there's another thing, inviting him into your home. If he ever came to your home, I suspect you'd rearrange the bookshelves. You may paint the living room a bit. You may make the night, the, the place acceptable. Well, it isn't Prince Philip who is coming to your home. The King of all kings, the most glorious, the most holy, the most wonderful person in the entire world is invited himself to your house. He's gonna check out your memories. He's gonna check out your wine cellar. He's gonna check out your bookshelf. He's gonna check out what you're watching. He's gonna check out everything about your life. He wants to go into your living room. He wants to go into your bedroom. He wants to go into your attic. He wants to go into your kitchen. He's listening and He is watching. And the reason we don't have what He is offering is that we only ever let Him into the foyer. He was a man who said, I want you in. I want you into every aspect of my life. I want you into my dreams. I want you into my thoughts. I want you into my aspirations. I want you into my past. I want you to speak salvation into every room of my house, everything. You can have it all. That's what happened to Zacchaeus. And then the fourth thing, Jesus offers us purpose. Can I just say Selwyn Hughes, and I'm just gonna read this. There is something in us that settles for an experience of God rather than an encounter with God. We come on a Sunday night, we like, we like the music, we like the atmosphere, we think it's cool. God is not wanting to give you an experience. He's wanting to give you an encounter. And when you've had an encounter, you're never, ever, ever gonna be the same. All right, number four, Jesus offers us purpose, but we must do what He commands. He said to Zacchaeus, come down immediately. He didn't say, if you would like me to bless you, you can come down. Please, Zacchaeus, I'd like to give you something. He didn't give any of that. He gave him a command because this, this isn't just a Saviour. This is God in the flesh, demanding something of you. Once I believed His Word, once I'd acknowledged my lostness, once I'd given everything to Him, you know what He did? He said, right, now you'll do this. I looked at my first year of Christianity and realised that all He ever did was tell me to do stuff. Stop being a biology teacher, okay. Stop, join an evangelistic team. All right, sell your car. Why? Because the church needs offender roads, okay? I'm gonna get married. Give your wedding money away, okay? It was just a litany of will you do what you are told? If you want to live a life of purpose, you've gotta do what He sets. What did He say to Matthew? Follow me. What did Matthew do? 
He followed Him. What did uh, He say to Peter and John? Follow me. What did they do? Dropped everything, followed Him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian says this, the response of the disciples is an act of obedience, not a confession of faith in Jesus. That's not to say you don't believe Him, that's the first step. But sooner or later, we're gonna have to do what He says. You know, I've had the privilege of spending some time with the Reinhard Bonnke evangelistic team. And in 1984, I went to Soweto where he was preaching. And on Thursday nights of his crusades, he would preach from this text, Zacchaeus. And he would challenge thieves to bring in their stolen goods. On one crusade, after the Thursday night, three truckloads of stolen goods were brought in. And then on occasion, he would actually, with the thieves, go back to the bosses from whom they'd stolen stuff and personally return the goods with the thieves. He did it on Thursday night because Friday night was Holy Spirit night. And he would gather up all the stuff, all the rubbish, all the junk in people's lives and he would burn it on Friday morning. And then Friday night, he'd ask the Holy Spirit to turn up and sometimes tens of thousands of people were filled with the Holy Spirit in one go. One of the reasons we're not living the full life that God wants us to live is because we won't give up the old stuff. I was there on Thursday night on the platform in Soweto when He called the people forward and said, bring your junk up. And they came by the thousands and literally threw all their stuff onto the platform. Literally, it was raining cigarettes, weapons, (laughs) occult fetishes, bottles of blood. The, The stage was chaos. I thought I could do that. So I went home and in the next crusade, we had a, I preached on it. We had a junk trunk at the front. I said, come down the front, bring your garbage. People would turn up at church with handfuls of pornography. One day someone turned up with a handful of, a greenhouse full of marijuana. (laughs) I decided not to burn that. If Jesus is in every one of your rooms, what's He gonna find? Are you gonna, are you actually gonna do what He says? He says to Zacchaeus today, salvation has come to this house. So here's Zacchaeus, he's on the platform now. He's trying to give you some advice. He learned a few things back in Luke 19. He's got some things to tell you. This is what he would say, I believe. Are you with with me? Number one, expect the impossible. Expect the impossible. The chapter before in Luke chapter 18 and verse 25, Jesus said it's almost impossible for rich people to go through the eye of a needle. I said it's for, re- let's read it. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. I said it was almost impossible. Actually, it is impossible for rich people to get saved. That's what He said the chapter before. And then just to prove the point, the next chapter, Zacchaeus was a very rich man. Jesus is all about doing the impossible. You wanna see me do the impossible? Rich people can't get to heaven. Bring me a rich man. Your problem may seem impossible, excellent. 
What great opportunities for God to act. If it were possible, you can do it. But since it is impossible, God's gonna do it. He's gonna break into your world. He's gonna break into your situation. He's gonna turn your circumstance around. He turns things around. That's what He does. Zacchaeus says to you, expect the impossible. Number two, overcome the obstacles. He was short, but he didn't use that as an excuse. He climbed a tree like the evangelist. He couldn't get to me, so he climbed across the seats. You can use shyness. You can use your personality. You can use your background. You can use your money. You can use whatever it is as an excuse. But can I just give you some advice from Zacchaeus? Overcome the obstacles. Our senior pastor, Brian Houston's father, invited me to come to Australia. When I was here, I said, why on earth did you invite me? He said, because when I was preaching in Kensington Temple in London, and I went into the green room, you fanned me. You push past all the security guards. You push past all the deacons. You went round the building that you'd never been to before. And then you banged on the door and walked straight into the elders meeting. And you said, I want to see Mr. Houston. And he was sitting there in the corner. And he said, that hunger is what I saw. That's what I wanted. I'm here because I overcame the obstacles. There's a story, of course, in the Bible where the, the, uh, the uh, friends had a paralysed friend and they couldn't get him to Jesus. You know the story? Luke chapter 18, is it? Luke chapter 18, the verse before, wherever it is, no, Luke chapter five, some men carrying a paralysed man on a mat try to take him into a house to lay him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way to do this, they went up on the roof and lowered him onto a mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Can I say, just doesn't, just get over yourself. If you wanna shout, shout. If you wanna climb over some chairs, climb over some chairs. If you're shy, just do it anyway. Overcome the obstacles. You've just got to get to Jesus. That's it. Zacchaeus, I'm short, but I'm going to find a way. I want to see Jesus. Here's another thing he'd say. Ig ig ignore the critics. Ignore the critics. It says, when Jesus came with them, they all started to mutter. I can't believe how some people give up on life because they've read what someone has said in social media. Who cares what they say? I've got my eyes fixed on Jesus. I'm looking at the one that matters, not the one who mutters. If you're spending your life looking at the critics, you're gonna get depressed. So why don't you turn your attention to Jesus? They were muttering all the way as He made His way with Jesus. Did He mind? No, He had Jesus with Him. Jesus was gonna come to His house. Jesus was gonna turn His situation around. Jesus was gonna forgive Him. Jesus is gonna turn your life around. Who cares what they say? I've met Jesus, I've been healed, I'm forgiven. They can say what they want. I've got Jesus in my house. Ignore the critics and finally accept the challenge. If He tells you to give your money away, give it away. If He tells you to give your life to preach the Gospel, that's what He wants you to do. If He says join Kingdom Builders and invest money into the things of God, do it. You're only gonna regret it if you don't. Accepted, it cost him everything, but he accepted the challenge. When I was a biology teacher, the last thing I wanted to do was to do what I'm doing. But Jesus said, I've got a better plan for you. 
I've got a better plan for you. Can I just say, I said, started today, salvation is in the house. I want you to just, as I draw this to a conclusion, remember the first line of Luke 19, Jesus was passing by. But Zacchaeus stopped him. You look up the phrase passing by in the New Testament, you'll find Jesus passed by the blind man, but he shouted and he stopped him. Jesus was passing by John the Baptist, but he shouted, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus stopped. Jesus passed by the lady who was bleeding and had been bleeding for the last 12 years. Jesus was passing by, but she stopped him with her touch of faith. What are you gonna do tonight to stop Jesus? Zacchaeus climbed a tree and his faith, his expectation, his leaning in, his desire, his need stopped Jesus. I stopped that evangelist, but more to the point, I stopped Jesus. Jesus knew my destiny. Jesus knew what I needed. Jesus had my best interest at heart. Jesus stopped a meeting to get to me, to heal me so that I could speak to you tonight. Jesus did that and He can do it for you. Do you want salvation to come to this house in your life? Who's believing for breakthrough? Could the team come? Who's believing for breakthrough? If you're believing for breakthrough and you've got faith from this message that God is gonna come to your situation, maybe healing, maybe provision, but you have made a decision tonight that you're gonna open up all your house to Him. You're gonna open up your house to Him. You're gonna say you can have the lot. You want breakthrough, but it comes at a cost. So if you want breakthrough and you're open, you're gonna open the door of your house and I'm talking to all you wonderful people online as well, stand up. Now remember, Jesus, He knows everything that we're going on. He knows our motivations, He knows our passions, He knows our dreams, He knows everything. So we might as well just open up the door and say, just clean this lot up. There's no point in painting the living room for Him to come. He's gonna paint it for you. He's gonna remove half the stuff in your house. He's gonna replace it with better stuff. He's, in fact, just, this is a thing, just give Him the keys. Just hand the keys over to Him. It's not my house, it's yours. You can have it. It's all yours. Now, You may be online and you're standing and hopefully you're standing wherever you are. This is what I want you to do. I want you to do something for me. Now, it's COVID, so we better not climb over the seats. But hey, we can shout. Do you remember in Luke chapter 18, was it the blind man? Jesus was passing by, what did the blind man do? Shouted, have mercy on me, son of David. And they said, shut up. What did he do? He shouted all the more. He shouted all the more and Jesus stopped. So what do you want me to do? He said, I want to see. You can see, your faith has made you whole. You can see, but He shouted all the more. Can we do that? Why don't you raise your hands and whatever it is that you want Jesus to deal with, maybe sickness, maybe provision, maybe breakthrough, maybe a salvation for a member of your family. Just raise your voice just for a minute and ask God, try and stop Him. Try and stop Him where He is. Try and stop Him. No one's stopping anything at this point. Yeah, that's better. Two people. All right, just stop, stop. Stop. Did you hear what I said? Brilliant. That's what you're wanting, just for a minute. 
I want you to actually get over yourself, overcome your obstacles and show me some hunger. Do you want this or not? It's worth it. Just break out, just for a minute. Raise your hands, raise your hands. Father God, break through in this meeting. Turn lives around. Set people free in the Name of Jesus. Thank You, Father. You are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You are the promise keeper. You are the one that does what You said You would do. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. Take over our lives. We give You everything, every part, every room, every thought, every dream in the Name of Jesus. Amen.